This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to easily and efficiently build and manage your own website. I did an egg lock of Pokemon Scarlet and things got wild. Oh my God, it's a shiny What? Just like in a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever. And I can only catch one Pokemon per area. But what makes an egg lock so special is that every Pokemon I catch is immediately traded on the dark web in exchange for a sweet, sweet egg. What's inside is a total mystery. It could be crap, or it could be a being of unimaginable power. I'm at the whims of beings greater than myself for this one. The rest of the rules for this playthrough are shown here and in the description down below, and we'll be following them for every boss battle in level cap order until we face off against Professor Sada in Area Zero. By the time I've gotten to Los Plateaus where I can start trading, I've already caught four Pokemon, all of which are immediately pawned off for some delicious eggs. My first egg hatches into an Azuril named Over Easy, who happens to have huge power and the egg move Belly Drum. This is an excellent first encounter. <laughs> Joining Over Easy and me on our adventure are a Fue Coco named Rancheros, a Tropius named Plant, and a Drifloon named Poached. These four wide-eyed newborns are able to carry me through the few mandatory battles before I'm allowed to explore the wild open world of Paldea, in a prescribed level cap order. In exchange for a Mareep abducted in South Province Area 2, Miguel sends me an egg that hatches into a blaze breed Tauros. Pretty cool Pokemon in theory, but Deviled has a modest nature and the ability Anger Point instead of Intimidate. So thanks for nothing, Miguel. Do better. Despite Miguel's clearly deliberate attempts at sabotage, Deviled is able to blaze his way through Katie's bug types for the first gym badge. I'll also be able to eventually fix his awful nature with a mint, so I guess Deviled isn't as bad as I'm making him out to be. But you're on thin ice, Miguel. Thin. Ice. On the way to Artizone for the second gym badge, I get a few more eggs, and the first one hatches into an adorable little applin named Benedict with an adamant nature. See, Miguel, this, this is a good Pokemon. Freaking modest Tauros, like, give me a break. The second egg hatches into a Spiritomb named Rotten. I didn't even know Spiritomb was in this game, so this is gonna be a fun Pokemon to use. My hatchlings will need to take out the Stony Cliff Titan Cloth that's strolling through South Province Area 3 before facing off against Brassius. Plant can terastalize into a pure grass type to drop her rock type weakness and supercharge her leaf storms, which she learns at level 1 for some reason. Combine that with an assist from Arvin Shelter, and Cloth's big meaty claws don't stand a chance. After absolutely chugging through the Sunflora hunt in the pouring rain, gotta love that low frame rate, Plant betrays her own kind and coals through Brassius' grass types with gusts. Against his first two Pokemon, her grass flying type gives her quad resistance, meaning that she can set up two growths without taking too much damage. And then against his grass terra type pseudo wudo with rock throw, I terastalize to once again drop our rock type weakness, and two gusts are enough to win the battle. The next boss battle is the Open Sky Titan, and I kind of forgot that this is the one Titan where you don't get to heal between fights, so this gets really scary. I only get out of it in one piece thanks to a Valiant Sacrifice from Arvin's Knackley and a Clutch Priority Shadow Sneak from Rotten. If Bombardier had landed a critical hit or two, we'd actually be mourning the first death of the run. But instead, it's all sunshines and smiles as we welcome five more newborns into the world. The first egg hatches into a Tinkatink, but since Tinkaton was one of the stars of my first Paldean playthrough, she's gonna go straight to the box this time. But sunny side up, the Torkoal with Drought will be seeing plenty of use. She and Scotch the Mareep are brand new team members that'll be replacing Rancheros the Crocolore and Goose the Bombardier, who get permanently boxed for the same reason as Tinkatink. I'll skip encounters I don't use from here on out, but you can bet your bottom dollar that I'm gonna be using this next hatchling, Don Dozo. I have no idea how he fit inside that egg, but that's the physics-defying badassery that we'll need to win this Nuzlocke. They say a man doesn't become a father until he holds his child. And while I can't hold Fish, when I look into his eyes, all I know since yesterday is everything has changed. From this day on, I exist simply to take care of Fish, whatever it takes. Fish, I will make you not just a king, but a god. You will claim dominion over all fish and rule with an unparalleled iron will. I swear this to you, my son. Your destiny is set. After some training, it's time for my children to complete their very first raid of a Team Star base. Kids grow up so fast. 
Deviled, the part-fighting type horse, and Rotten, the collective of 108 damn souls, worked together to take down Giacomo's dark type Sagan Starmobile without ever being in too much danger. This is the second boss in a row that Rotten's knocked out with a priority shadow sneak. He's the hardest working collective of 108 damn souls that I've ever met. He's also the only collective of 108 damn souls that I've ever met. But anyways, next up are Iono and her electric types for badge number three. Sunny Side Up's got those drought-boosted flamethrowers, which she uses to roast Watro like the villains at the end of a Tarantino movie. Belly Bolt is next, so Plant comes in after we've put him to sleep with a yawn. After terastalizing, we can safely set up a few growths and then eviscerate Iono's team with boosted magical leaves. I mean, actually, Plant isn't exactly the strongest attacker, and I wouldn't describe Tropius as a good, or even kind of good, Pokemon, so eviscerate might be too strong of a word. But at least we get the one shot on Miss Magius with a Leaf Storm to close out the battle. That was incredibly whelming, Plant, but you got the job done, so I can't complain. From here, we have to face off against another Team Star boss, so I make sure to train Fish up by letting him feast on his favorite food, unsuspecting land animals. You thought you were safe, little piggy, but no one's safe when Fish, the future king god of fish, is on the hunt. Fish craves fresh land meat. He'll feast on the flesh of innocent Pokemon until he's grown stronger than anyone could ever imagine. So anyways, Mela and her fire types are forced to face down Fish in all 485 pounds of his eternal glory. She never stood a chance against the soon-to-be King God of Fish. One thing is clear from this fight, though. When his reign begins, Fish will not be a benevolent leader. What's that, Fish? You're saying if people aren't subscribed to Flygon HG, their day of reckoning is nigh? Better fix that ASAP. It saves your soul, and it really helps out the channel. After Sunnyside Up clicks Flamethrower twice into the Orthworm Titan, it's time to face off against Kofu and Cascarafa for the fourth gym badge. Over easy, the Azumarill kills Vuvuzela with a few play roughs without taking much damage in return. By putting the Wug Trio to sleep with a yawn from Sunny Side Up, Benedict, the now fully evolved Flapple, comes in and sets up a Dragon Dance, which she learns at the shockingly low level of 24. After that, an Acrobatics kills the Wug Trio in his sleep, leaving Kofu with just a Crabominable. Now you might think that having a Grass Dragon type out against an Ice type is a recipe for disaster, but Kofu's Crabominable doesn't actually know any Ice type moves. So down goes the Snow Crab, and the fourth gym badge is ours. Time to hatch five more eggs. At the grocery store, five eggs will cost you like six dollars nowadays, so getting them for free is a screaming deal. I might not have employer healthcare, but don't say this whole YouTube thing doesn't come without some benefits. Let's see what these puppies hatch into. In mere seconds, the first egg is ready to hatch, and with such a short hatch cycle, I assume that it's just gonna be a magic card. But you know what they say about assuming. Shiny Larvitar, baby! Now as much as I want to credit this to my natural talent as a shiny hunter, it turns out that the owner of this egg saved their game before the egg hatched, and then restarted the game and traded the egg over to me, thereby ensuring that I would get a shiny. I am so grateful for whoever sent this to me. I mean, not grateful enough to spend 5 minutes looking through the VOD to figure out who it was, but grateful nonetheless. In comparison to a shiny Larvitar, the rest of these encounters might as well be more Tauros from El Rancho de Miguel, but I'll mention the two important ones that we end up using. There's Kinder the Beep Beep Pony, and Roll the Tynamo. The former immediately evolves into Ferrigiraffe, aka Honk Honk Horsey, right in time to face off against Atticus and his poison types. Without a steel type, this is a pretty scary fight. He leads with a Skun Tank, and I lead with And Ham, who has evolved into a beautiful purple Pupitar. Say that ten times fast. A Sucker Punch does nasty damage as we retaliate with a Bulldoze. I switch to Sunny Side Up to avoid getting Sucker Punched again, and then I go for Yawn, hoping that Stun Tank will stick with Sucker Punches. But unfortunately, he switches to Venishock, which does really solid damage and Ham comes back in on a Toxic, though at least he has a Petcha Berry to heal the poison. So finally, Skuntank goes down to an Earthquake, which probably would have gotten the KO in the first place. I way overcomplicated that. Atticus's actual Rever Room is next, but he's fortunately walled by Sunnyside Up, who gets the one-shot with a Flamethrower. Muck is third, so Kinder comes in and takes care of him with a few Terra Boosted Twin Beams, though he does have to tank a few Sludge Waves, meaning that we gotta switch out as the Navi Starmobile comes in last. Fish, the future King God of Fish, comes in on a Noxious Torque. 
It doesn't do much as we retaliate with bulldozes, and our held covert cloak means that Fish won't get poisoned. Eventually, though, Fish falls into the red as we hit the Starmobile with a tickle. In hindsight, I probably should have tickled first. But this means that Fish's job is done, and it's off to Rotten, who gets badly poisoned by the Starmobile's toxic debris. He's only able to tank a single critical hit spin out and fire off a Psybeam before it's time to switch out again, this time to Benedict. I go for a Leech Seed, which I'm dismayed to learn does not work against Starmobiles. You learn something new every day, but that lesson might cost little Benedict her fruitful life. I have no choice but to keep her in and get some damage off. A Sucker Punch does do decent damage before the Navi Starmobile retaliates with a super effective Noxious Torque, but Benedict survives with 2 HP, and with a held Aya Papa Berry, she recovers enough HP to survive the poison damage. So, I can now switch to And Ham, who shrugs off a Noxious Torque, and then outspeeds to finally kill the Starmobile with an Earthquake. That was a hard battle, made even harder by several misplays from yours truly. In the end though, the team made it out in one piece, and the run remains deathless. But being that close to death really makes you rethink things. Normally when I catch a Pokemon, I'm meeting them out in the wild. Some of them have already lived full lives by the time they join me on my adventure. But in an egglock, all my Pokemon were born into this life. I was the first living thing that they ever saw. And this team is the only family that they'll ever know. In a way, it makes each of their lives all the more precious, and potential losses all the more tragic. These Pokemon are my children, and I their father. Making it through this challenge deathless is more imperative than ever. My children, they look to me with trust and love. I will not let them down. After that nail-biter of a fight, it's nice that Larry, the fifth gym leader, is a walk in the park. Deviled takes care of his lead Komala, Poach, who has evolved into Drifblim, is completely immune to Dedunsparce's two attacking moves, and Larry's Terra-type Staraptor is walled by And Ham holding an Eviolite. And Ham also gets to kill the bird with a few earthquakes. It's always funny to see a flying type fall to a ground type move, but terastalization is a hell of a drug. The next chunk of the game before getting to the battles in the end game is always a bit of a slog and never particularly difficult. The double battle against Rhyme is easily won with the 1 2 punch of And Ham and Rotten. Only a few Pokemon survive a plus 2 Terra boosted Sucker Punch, and a Ghost Terra type Toxtricity is not one of them. The Quaking Earth Titan, my arch nemesis, is handled moderately well by Over Easy the Azumarill, though it's actually Arvin who gets the final hit onto Great Tusk for the KO. Much like Ryan before her, the 7th Gym Leader Tulip is handily defeated by Terra Boosted Sucker Punches from Rotten, though this time we do have to do it without getting stat boosts from the crowd. It goes perfectly. Definitely didn't almost lose Fish the Gardevoir because I forgot she had Energy Ball. Nope, everything in that fight was totally calculated. Anyways, that brings us to our final batch of eggs. Fortunately, the two eggs that I hatch here are both very good Pokemon. First is a Scyther, who I named Fabergi. Buckle up nerds who get physically ill from people mispronouncing words. The second egg hatches into a little baby Charmander, which somehow feels like a refreshing encounter, despite Charizard being the most overused Pokemon in the entire series. Both of these little fellas will evolve soon enough and become rotating members of our ever-expanding squad of hatched heroes. For now though, it's Deviled who gets to use Raging Bull to crash through Grusha's ice types like a bull in a china shop. It's not all that exciting, but you know what is exciting? A visit from Poppy HG! Have you checked out poppyhg.com yet? It's the only website in the world where you can find dozens of curated pictures of Poppy HG. And this beautiful website was created with the help of the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Using their all-in-one platform, it's quick and painless to easily design professional and polished websites, especially thanks to Squarespace's selection of customizable templates. Making changes and adding new pictures to poppyhg.com is as easy as just clicking a few buttons, and I have complete control over the design and look of the website. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. 
So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, or your own adorable corgi puppy, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's dive into the endgame of my egglock of Pokemon Scarlet. Up next is the raid of the fourth Team Star base and the fight against the fairy type Star Boss. For the life of me, I can never remember this kid's name and I absolutely refuse to learn it. I wanna say it's like Opie or something, but it doesn't matter. Rich Boy Winston has more finesse in his pinky finger than Opie has in his entire body. Roll, the now fully evolved Electros, takes care of Opie's lead Azumarill. And then Fabergie deals with his physical Wigglytuff and Doshbun. We can use a few swords dances to offset the baby doll eyes attack drops that Opie's Pokemon love spamming. This primes Fabergi for a quick and dirty disposal of the Rooch Botch Starmobile with a combination of Iron Head and Bullet Punch, putting a swift end to Opie's pastel-colored Reign of Terror. From here, it's off to Casaroya Lake to take on the fifth and final Titan. And there's only one man for the job, or should I say, one fish for the job. It's time for Fish to challenge the Titan Dondozo for the title of Paldea's Most Powerful Fish. The Titan is jacked up on jungle juice, but it's nothing compared to Fish's raw natural power. After a few tickles, and with some assists from Arvin's Greedent, Fish kills the Titan of Casaroya Lake and claims the throne that was promised to him at birth. Fish will now and forever be known as the King God of Fish. But as soon as Fish's reign begins, Tatsugiri appears to challenge his right to the throne. There's always going to be haters, but by making an example of this first Tatsugiri, Fish will be able to silence thousands of potential others. So with a ruthlessness only seen in beings who have transcended to a higher form of existence, Fish destroys Tatsugiri with a few order ups, ensuring that his reign as the king god of fish remains uncontested for the rest of time. With all five titans defeated, and all eight gym badges obtained, there's just one boss battle before the endgame boss gauntlet, and that's the final team star boss, Eerie. She can be pretty scary, but with enough preparation and a halfway decent fairy type, this isn't as hard as you might expect. You just gotta be a little careful. Toxicroak goes down to a single psychic from Rotten. Lucario, despite being a steel type, doesn't know a steel type move, so over easy is an easy counter. After shrugging off an Aura Sphere, a Terra Boosted Playrough gets the one shot. Passimian hits pretty hard with a close combat, but we obviously retaliate with another Playrough for another one shot. Notice how we aren't missing these Playroughs? That's because we've got a wide lens to boost our accuracy to 99%. So even though Annihilate also nails us with a nasty close combat, a third Playrough connects and gets yet another one shot. That just leaves the Starmobile, but with Overeasy at risk to a super effective spinout, this is gonna be up to my five other team members, though we really only need two. Sunny Side Up can reset the Cave Starmobile's boosts with Clear Smog, and Fried, the now fully evolved Charizard, resists or is immune to all three of their attacks. He can also fire off super effective air slashes, no pun intended, for massive amounts of damage. We close out the battle with a flamethrower just to make sure we don't miss, and with that, all five Team Star bosses are defeated, and it's time to take on the bosses of the Scarlet and Violet Endgame. This starts with a fight against Clavel, who has a pretty diverse team. Fortunately, we can deal with many of his Pokemon by using And Ham, who has now evolved into a shiny Tyranitar, or as I've affectionately started calling him, Tyler Tar. Crunch one-shots Clavel's lead Orangaroo. Abomasnow sets up an Aura Veil before Fried kills him with a Flamethrower. Gyarados is third, and by pivoting through Overeasy, I can bring Roll in on an Earthquake, who kills with a vo I mean, who does good damage with a Volt Switch and brings Overeasy back in on an Aqua Tail. Stupid Aurora Veil. Okay, well, Roll comes back in now, though this time she gets nailed by a Stone Edge. But then we kill Gyarados with a second choice Scarf Volt Switch, bringing Tyler Tar back in as Clavel sends out Houndoom. After getting tickled by a Thunderfang, Earthquake takes out Houndoom. Then Poltegeist goes down to a crunch, so all of a sudden, Clavel is left with just his Meowskarada, but he's powerless against Sunny Side Up, who shrugs off a Flower Trick and then a Thunder Punch that paralyzes, before torching the Kitty Cat with a single Flamethrower and winning us the battle. Next up is the Paldean Elite Four. For this challenge, we're going with the team of Andham the Tyler Tar, Miguel's Dollar Tree Tauros, Babergi the Caesar, Overeasy the Azumarill, Roll the Electros, and Fried the Charizard. They've all come so far since they hatched out of those physics-defying eggs, and we've managed to make it here without a single death. 
Losing even a single hatchling would be devastating, so I'll be doing everything in my power to keep my babies safe. Let's do this. Rika's first and leads with a Whiskash, so Roll, equipped with a Choice Scarf, comes out swinging with a Giga Drain for the one-shot. Dawnfan is third and can't be one-shot thanks to Sturdy, though it doesn't actually even matter since Giga Drain isn't enough for a one-shot anyways. That's impressive both, but less impressive is the Stone Edge miss that lets Roll finish off the Stubby Elephant with another Giga Drain and staying at full HP. Doug Trio is third and sets up a Sandstorm, which causes Roll to miss. But we connect on the next turn, recovering all the HP lost from a Rock Slide and Sandstorm Chip. That brings out Camera up next, so it's time to finally switch to Over Easy. She comes in on a yawn, but then one shots Camera up with a liquidation. So last is Rika's Claude Zire, who's walled fairly effectively by Roll. Thanks to the Terastalization, Giga Drain now does super effective damage to Rika's ace. So a few turns later, we've fully sucked the life out of Claude Zire and won the battle against the very first Elite Four member. Next up is Poppy, but by this point I've fixed Devil's abysmal modest nature, so he mows through all of Poppy's steel types like a bull in a china shop. I know I already used that simile in the battle against Grusha, but it makes more sense here against steel types, so just pretend that I'm saying it for the first time. Anyways, next up is round 2 against Larry, who now has flying types. But guess who's holding a choice scarf and knows Ice Spinner? This isn't a pure sweep because Staraptor lowers over Easy's attack with an Intimidate. So I do need to switch to Roll on a Brave Bird, who then kills Staraptor with a Volt Switch that brings over Easy back in. But then it's a sweep. W well, sorta. Oricorio actually survives an Ice Spinner, so fortunately I had the foresight to Terastalize to drop my Electric type weakness, because otherwise a Revelation Dance would have hurt. Because Ice Spinner didn't kill Oricorio, I'm worried that we'll also miss out on the kill against Flamigo, who has similar bulk. So I first switch to And Ham on a Terra Boosted but resisted Brave Bird. Then it's back to Over Easy on a baited close combat. So now, with the chip from Sandstorm and the defense drop, Over Easy cleanly takes out Larry's fifth and final bird with an Ice Spinner, winning us the battle. That means that last for the Elite Four is Hassel the Dragon Trainer. Noivern is first, so I lead with Fried, who takes advantage of the fact that Game Freak never gave him a secondary Dragon type, and therefore does not have a Dragon type weakness. Two Dragon Pulses are enough to take out Noivern, who can only retaliate with a single Super Fang. Babergy comes in to take care of Hassel's Haxorus next, crunches his best damaging move into my Steel-type Bug, but a combination of Iron Head and U-Turn is enough to finish him off before the damage piles up. It also gives me a safe switch into And Ham as Dragalgy comes in third. He obviously goes down to an Earthquake, bringing Flapple in fourth. And though Flapple does have super effective seed bombs, Tyler Tar is bulky enough that even a critical hit wouldn't get the one shot, so we're safe to stay in and take out the smallest of Hassel's Pokemon with two crunches. Last is Bax Calibur, but Hassel's ace is completely walled by Over Easy. The best he can do is hit us with a few icicle crashes, but with a wide lens, we're all but guaranteed to connect with two play roughs, which take out Bax Calibur and win us the fight against the final member of the Elite Four. But now it's time for the champion, and while she may not be Cynthia level, she still demands some respect. This battle is all about positioning so that you can be ready for what's coming in next, and Ham is my lead into Gita's Espathra, and although she can fire off a super effective Dazzling Gleam, our Held Assault Vest and the special defense boost from our Sandstorm means that the damage is minimal as the Psychic Chicken just falls to a crunch. Avalug is baited in via Body Press, so Fried takes the attack on the switch, and then we melt her down with a flamethrower. King Gambit is third, and Fried actually isn't strong enough for the one-shot with flamethrower, so it's off to Deviled who takes neutral damage from a nasty Stone Edge, and then kills King Gambit with a close combat on the following turn. Next up, Vuvuzela. So it's off to Over Easy. We've seen this matchup before, and it goes just as well this time around. Two play roughs and the pointy fish goes down. Fifth is Go Goat, so it's off to Fabergi as he sets up a bulk up. The idea is to U-turn off of this Gogo to get Tyler Tar in for free, who will then be able to easily take out Gita's Glamora before she can do any damage. Because Gogo sets up with Bulk Up though, I need to hit him with two Iron Heads before he goes down to a U-turn. But our second Iron Head crits, which bypasses Gogo's defense boosts and gets the knockout. So as Glamora takes the field, Fabergi is still hanging around. I guess he wanted the glory of victory all to himself. After terastalizing, Glamora outspeeds, but goes for Earth Power instead of a Rock-type Terra Blast. So we retaliate with an Iron Head for a clean knockout. Mini Crisis averted, and the battle is won! 
But the challenge isn't over, and the hardest fights are still to come. To close out the Starfall Street storyline, we need to fight Penny and her evolutions. Her lead Umbreon falls to Febergi, the limelight-obsessed Caesar. He baits out Flareon second, and this is one matchup he can't win. So it's off to and Ham on a fire spin. Despite an attack drop from a baby doll eyes, an earthquake gets the knockout. Vaporeon is third, but gets walled by any water type, so over easy takes him out with a few play rubs. Next up is Jolteon, so now it's time for a showdown of the pure electric types. With Giga Drain at her disposal, Roll has this one sealed up no problem. Leafeon is fifth, and the final Pokemon before Penny is a Sylveon. With a bit of patience, I get Fabergi into a position where he takes out Leafeon without getting his attack lowered by Baby Doll Eyes. This puts him in the perfect position to face down Penny's terrifying terrestrialized Sylveon. With a single Iron Head, Sylveon falls, and the final fight in the Starfall Street storyline is won. So next up is Arvin. At the start of the battle, it's raining, which is excellent news for Fish, the King God of Fish. But to kick things off, I lead with Deviled, who's able to take out Greedent with a single close combat. That brings in Garganical, so it's off to Fish, who unfortunately comes in right as the rain stops. Or does it? It doesn't look like it's raining, but Liquidation absolutely should not KO Garganical without the rain. So this is really weird. By checking the state of the battlefield, yep, looks like the rain is still in effect, even though it's no longer visible on screen. These games are really something, aren't they? Anyways, with Toad's Gruel out third, it's off to Fabergi, who gets hit by a Spore, which is super annoying. She then starts hitting me with Earth Power as I take a snooze. I terrestrialize so that we resist the next Earth Power, but we continue to sleep for another turn. So, Toad's Gruel switches to Sludge Bomb for one final turn of damage before Fabergi finally wakes up and takes the kill with an X Scissors. Scovillain is fourth, so I bring Fish back in on a Fire Blast. Then it's off to Fried, who's sporting some very fashionable heavy-duty boots to stop him from losing 50% to Garganical Stealth Rocks. Then an Air Slash finishes off Scovillain. A switch to Roll on a critical hit liquidation, followed by a Thunderbolt takes care of Arvin's Cloister, leaving him with his Mabostiff, who was until very recently at Death's Door. So it's off to Deviled, who shrugs off a Terra Boosted Crunch, and then retaliates with a close combat, winning us the battle. I know I've given Miguel a lot of crap throughout this video, but Deviled has been really solid throughout this entire playthrough. I think it's really important to acknowledge when you're wrong and to own up to your actions. So I guess what I'm saying is that Miguel, if you're watching, I forgive you, and I'll gladly accept your apology whenever you're ready. Now it's time to prepare for the final fight against Nimona, and in order to do that, I have the bright idea of heading to the Chansey Supply Store to get an ability capsule that will change Febergi's swarm into Technician. And, uh, well... Oh, shit! No, 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 no! Uh-oh. Am I gonna have to fight her? Fun fact, ability capsules can't even be purchased until after defeating Professor Sada, so this was a capital O oopsie. I can't believe that I've been deathless this entire playthrough, and it all might go up in flames because I accidentally started the hardest battle in the game unprepared. I mean, I actually can believe it, but this feels like I've let my children down. They're gonna have to play their hearts out if we want to avoid a family tragedy here. First up is Nimona's Lycanroc against Deviled. This ends up being a fairly solid accidental lead, since Deviled can outspeed and one-shot Lycanroc with a close combat. That brings in Orthworm second, so it's off to Fried on an Earthquake. And then Fried fries him with a Flamethrower for yet another one-shot. But third is Pawmot, and this little shit is actually a massive issue. Look at him. The face of pure evil. Close Combat and Double Shock both just hit so hard, and with the six Pokemon I have, there isn't a super easy way to take out Pama quickly. I decide that my best bet is to Terrastalize Fried so that he loses his Electric-type weakness. This means that we can safely fire off a Terra Boosted Flamethrower and hopefully survive a Double Shock in Retaliation as long as Pama doesn't crit. But it's actually Fried who gets the crit, killing Pama in one shot. Plot Armor beats stupid every time, baby. Fourth is Gudra, who's also a bit of an issue. I stay in for a turn to get off some damage with Dragon Pulse, since I know that we're safe from even a critical hit Muddy Water. But then I gotta switch out. 
Fish is a relatively safe switch here, but I need him as healthy as possible for Nimona's Terra-type Skeledurge that's waiting in the back. I've already wasted my Terra, and Skeledurge will outspeed us, so the King God of Fish will need to tank at minimum two hits. For that reason, I decide to switch to Benedict on a Muddy Water. This will bait an Ice Beam, which theoretically gives me a safe switch into Devil as long as Gudra doesn't freeze, but I've been screwed by freeze way too many times in the past. So I first switch to Roll, who for what it's worth does not get frozen. But now I use Volt Switch to bring in Devil on a Dragon Pulse, which does less than 50%. And then a Close Combat finishes off Nimona's Friendshape Pseudo Legendary. That brings in Nimona's rare three segmented Dud Unsparse. So I suppose he's actually a Dud Dud Dun Sparse. But that extra segment doesn't save him from falling to a super effective Close Combat. With that, Nimona's left with her Skeledurge, easily her scariest Pokemon. Terra boosted Torch Songs can be pretty terrifying, especially stacked with a Blaze Boost. This is all up to Fish, the King God of Fish. Fortunately, Skeledurge decides to go for an Earth Power on the Switch instead of Torch Song. Makes sense since he was trying to target Deviled. Unironically, if Nimona's Skeledurge only knew Torch Song, he would be so much scarier. Since Earth Power didn't get a special defense drop, the King God of Fish is safe to tank two Shadow Balls from Skeledurge and retaliate with Liquidations both times. The second Liquidation takes out Skeledurge, so miraculously, we win a battle that could have been an absolute disaster. But there's still one last challenge to face. The coolest, scariest final boss battle that the Pokemon franchise has ever seen. It's time to save the world from AI Professor Sada and win this Egglock once and for all. Sada leads with her Ancient Mothy friend. Very fluffy, but very weak to flying type moves. An Air Slash from everyone's favorite Pokemon gets the one shot on the Bug Fighting type Paradox Pokemon. That brings in Fluttermane next, so it's time for a switch to Fabergi on a baited Power Gem. This Pokemon is crazy strong and crazy fast, but they're also very frail. Even a non-technician priority bullet punch is enough for the one-shot, with an expert belt, of course. So third is Brute Bonnet, the grass dark type of Moongus. Thanks for the free KO, Sada. I mean, I guess it's not technically free since they do get off a pretty gnarly sucker punch, but Fabergie's job is done. As Sandy Shocks comes in fourth, it's off to roll. Two Giga Drains are enough to take out the Ancient Magneton, which frankly doesn't really make much sense as a concept, but I'll give it a pass because Sandy Shocks is rad. Screamtail is fifth, so it's time for Fish, the King God of Fish, to take the stage. A play rough tickles Fish on the switch in, and even though Screamtail outspeeds us, we out damage with Liquidation, and the Pink Banshee falls a few turns later. That's what you get for opposing the rightful King God of Fish. Last, but certainly not least, is Mommy's Roaring Moon, whose attack gets buffed by a held booster energy. But we have just the counter for this dark dragon type variant of Salamence, and her name is Over Easy, my very first child. She comes in on a Dragon Claw for free. And then, not wanting to leave anything to chance, we Terastalize, tank a frankly embarrassing Earthquake, and nail Roaring Moon with a nasty fairy type Terra Blast. As Roaring Moon falls, we've won the battle, and my first ever Egglock of Pokemon Scarlet completely deathless. Whoever said you couldn't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs was clearly an idiot. They definitely weren't very good at Pokemon, that's for sure. I hope you enjoyed this Egglock, and if you'd like to see more Egglocks, possibly in a different game, let me know by leaving a comment. And it'd also be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And you should consider subscribing to my Patreon, which is the best way to directly support the channel and comes with bonus content and early video access. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.